Thank you, David, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, the Prime Minister's speech in France has created a new dynamic in our negotiations, and uh, we have felt this during the negotiations this week, uh, as uh, David just uh, said. On Monday, I said that we needed a moment of clarity. David and I, as well as our teams, worked well together. I want to thank both teams uh, for their dedication, their professionalism, and their expertise. We managed to create clarity on some points. On others, however, more work remains to be done and we are not there yet. But uh, we will keep working in a constructive spirit until we reach a deal on the essential principles of the UK's orderly withdrawal. Uh, allow me also on my side uh, to briefly outline what was agreed this week and what more needs to be done. On citizen rights, our priority, the UK has agreed to give direct effect to the withdrawal agreement. This is very important. It will give the assurance to our citizens that they will be able to invoke their rights as defined by the withdrawal agreement before UK courts. We agreed to guarantee for the citizens concerned that the UK will apply EU law concepts in a manner that is consistent with EU law after Brexit. But we failed to agree that the European Court of Justice must play, must play an indispensable role in ensuring the, this consistency. This is a stumbling block for the EU. There are others. Number one, a big gap remains between our positions on family reunification. We want existing rights to continue for the citizens concerned. Number two, the export of social security benefits also remains to be discussed. And number three, citizens need simplified administrative procedures the UK started, stated its intention to put in place a streamlined system. We are looking, David, forward to hearing the details about this new system. On the financial settlement, an expert group held detailed talks on technical aspects, and those talks were useful. Prime Minister May said two things in Florence. First, that no member state should pay more and no member state should receive less because of Brexit. Second, that the UK will honour commitments taken during its membership. This week, the UK negotiating team made clear that uh, Applying the first principle would be limited to 2019 and 2020. And the UK explained also that it is not in a position yet to identify its commitments taken during membership. For the EU, the only way, the only way to reach sufficient progress is that all commitments undertaken at 28 are honoured at 28. On Ireland, we had a constructive, once again, a constructive discussion and we made progress in some areas. As David just said, both the EU and the UK recognise that Ireland is in a unique situation. 
any solution will need to be fully informed by the spe special circumstances on the island of Ireland. As I mentioned several times, several times, such solutions must respect both the integrity of the single market and the union's legal order and the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts. We also confirmed our commitments towards maintaining the common travel area and started drafting common principles. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had a constructive week, yes, but we are not yet there in terms of achieving sufficient progress. Further work is needed in the coming weeks and coming months. In three weeks from now, the October European Council will be an opportunity for me to take stock of the negotiations with the President Juncker and the President Tusk and the 27 head of states or government. I also look forward uh, next week to the European Parliament's resolution, which is important. I hope that the new dynamic created by Prime Minister's May speech in Florence will continue to inform our work. Let's leave it here. We will pick up in the week of uh, the 9th of October, where we left off this week. And I want to thank you for your attention, too. And we have a lot of time now for um, four questions. And um, I will start with Ben. Thank you very much. Ben Thank you very much. Ben Wright from the BBC. Uh, two questions, uh, if I may. Uh, David Davis, your tone today is clearly more optimistic. There's a warmer atmosphere in here. Uh, but there are obviously big stumbling blocks, in particular the role of the ECJ in forcing citizens' rights and the massive issue of money. The European Union clearly want commitments uh, for more. Do you honestly feel that this is a proper negotiation, or are you simply trying to pass a series of tests the EU is setting you. Uh, and uh, Monsieur Barnier, if I may, could you define more clearly for us, please, the phrase sufficient progress? It's very vague. Uh, and couldn't it be argued that it's your ver very narrow interpretation of the negotiating mandate that is holding these talks back? Um, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, sometimes the questions make me laugh. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a proper negotiation. Um, the, we're here every, every uh, round with 100 officials. Uh, and to take one example today, I mean, later on today, you'll be, we'll be publishing an updated table of progress on citizens' rights that shows the direct outcome of those negotiations. Now, if you look at them, you'll see... Most of them are now green, as they term it, and it's, a, it's an agreement between us. And most of them, all of them, uh, help uh, all or part of the 3 million European Union citizens and the 1 million United Kingdom citizens, uh, or both. Uh, and so it's to their advantage. The same thing is true of Northern Ireland, where we've made real progress. There's not been a one-way process at all. And broadly, thanks to the Prime Minister's speech last week, we've made tangible progress in other areas. And I hope we'll see in the future, for example, uh, very significant progress on the question of uh, the implementation period that will come in due course. Uh, but again, that's, uh, that's not a one-way process. Uh, the, the, the Britannic... UK citizens decided to leave the European Union. That was their sovereign decision. The United Kingdom government confirmed that they wished to leave the customs union and the internal market. Those are decisions which are heavy with consequences. They're serious decisions. And as David said earlier on, there are complicated consequences in all sorts of areas, human, social, legal, financial economic, technical. So you shouldn't be surprised. You shouldn't be surprised that these rounds, which are all useful, 
Some of them have more stumbling blocks. Some of them have disappointments. And some of them take steps forward. And we've had important clarifications this week. But you shouldn't be surprised that this takes time. The necessary time. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, I mean, remember that this is not the usual kind of negotiation for the European Commission. We don't have a, a text or a directive to defend. Um, I'm uh, the negotiator here in the Commission, and I, I have the trust of 27 governments, the heads of state or government, and of the European Parliament. And my job is, is simply... Uh, to make sure that we find the ways and means for an orderly withdrawal. That is, an agreement, an agreement with the United Kingdom at the point where they leave, which is much better than leaving without an agreement, and that we do it by protecting the interests of the 27, and that we make sure that the European taxpayer doesn't have to carry the burden of decisions taken by the citizens of the United Kingdom and making sure that we preserve the integrity of the internal market and uh, the non-negotiable integrity of the autonomy of decision-making amongst the 27 in deciding their own destiny. So once again, as, as David said, and as I have said myself, I think that it's positive that Theresa May's speech made it possible to unblock the situation to some extent and give a new dynamic uh, to the situation but we're far from being at a stage uh, and it will take weeks or maybe even months where we'll be able to say yes okay there's been sufficient progress on the principles of this orderly withdrawal okay Bruno Bruno Waterfield Times of London um, First, for, for Mr. Davis, um, the, the, uh, the, the arrangements for European nationals living in um, Britain, direct effect, effect of the withdrawal treaty, won't be able to be amended by uh, Parliament, um, that um, uh, European law concepts will continue to apply and be visible through that in the UK. Of course, it sounds awfully like the European Communities Act um, 1972. Can you explain to us why um, it won't be? Uh, we see the figures for liabilities um, in the 2016 budget, an all-time high, 238.8 um, billion. Can you tell us which part of those commitments um, Britain will honour? Britain said it would honour those commitments and which part it won't. Um, Mr Barnier, uh, next, on October the 9th, um, we, we, we're hearing that, that Britain will make new concrete proposals um, on these um, areas uh, uh, to you. If, if they go some way to addressing your concerns, would you ask the European Council on the 19th of October to adjust your mandate in order to be able to get deep into the nitty-gritty um, of a transition arrangement? Um, uh, thank you, Bruno. Uh, it doesn't look anything like the 1972 Act to me. Let's say what it is. Uh, we have been discussing this, you might imagine, this is central, this issue of uh, the rights of European Union citizens of the UK. And we accept and have done from the start that there is a need for certainty for them. Uh, and that's what we are aiming to produce without uh, allowing the European Court of Justice to make rulings within and on cases in the UK. And this is the compromise we are, we are working towards. It's not unusual. There are plenty of arrangements where we have treaties that uh, confine what the, the United Kingdom do, very specific, uh, with very real aims. And that's what we're doing here. As for the money, we're not doing the negotiation standing here. No. I answered uh, earlier on about sufficient progress. I mean, we could go into the details, but if you read the papers and the position papers that have been made public with full transparency by, by the Commission and by my, my team, I think you can see, I mean, you can see what we expect. It's all about uh, sustainable protection of citizens' rights in time, coherent interpretation of those rights uh, on both sides, 
and the financial settlement. We're asking for the fact that the commitments entered into by 28 be honoured by 28. No more, no less. And on Ireland, we're making progress. I mean, as soon as possible, um, as soon as... And I take my responsibilities as a negotiator seriously. As soon as I can say that we're there, in that first sequence, underpinning the orderly withdrawal, then as soon as possible, I shall recommend... I, I shall recommend to the European Council uh, that uh, we, we start the second stage in the sequence, which would then be addressing... Uh, the, the request that the UK government put forward through this um, Theresa May uh, for the first time, I mean, David had, had mentioned it, uh, but this transition period, I mean, the 27 are not surprised by that request from the United Kingdom for a transition period. I, I have uh, the basic document, which uh, is my mandate, and, and which does indeed describe the conditions under which we would be able to discuss in good time, and I hope that that won't be in a long time, but discuss a transition period. And if you read that, that document, because it is extremely specific and extremely precise, I, I wasn't surprised by this request from the United Kingdom side. But uh, as I said, in order to get to that second stage, which may well have a link with the orderly withdrawal, but we're still under Article 50, and that means that uh, uh, and the drafting of a treaty organising uh, the withdrawal of the United Kingdom. As I said, I have a clear mandate, which I have to respect, that orderly withdrawal includes a certain number of uh, separation issues. We've just discussed some of them, and amongst them is the possibility of a transition phase. As soon as I can, as soon as I can deem that there's uh, real progress uh, and report back to those who gave me the mandate, I shall do so. Um, and then we would be able speedily to move on to the second stage in the sequence. Next on my list is uh, Simon. Thanks, uh, Simon Taylor from MLEX. Question for Mr. Barnier. Um, the, um, sorry, the, um, uh, Mr. Davis said uh, on Monday that um, the financial settlement could only properly be resolved um, uh, at a later stage when the future relationship was clarified. Um, do you, have you come round to his point of view, or if not, then surely the chances of moving forward on this discussion uh, are, are still blocked? On the substance, first of all, thanks to those two sentences, those two sentences which uh, I deem constructive, as I said um, very soon afterwards, that the sentences spoken by the Prime Minister in Florence, Theresa May, uh, I mean, it, it helps us clarify things. Um, it's very important that the Prime Minister says and it's been specified that it's 2019-2020, of course, but that the member states of the Union will not have to pay more or receive less. That's very useful. But if you're only talking about two years, that's not the end, is it? The second sentence is also important, of course, though, that is recognising that the commitments entered into by the United Kingdom during the period where they were a member of the Union up to the, up to the time of their withdrawal, all those commitments will be honoured, um, or taken together in a pooled fashion, if you, if you will, will have to be respected and, and honoured by 28. And I hope that uh, we can clarify that point moving forward, and I hope we can get a clear undertaking uh, on, on that point, which is the translation of what I've been calling sufficient progress on that subject, which is indissociable from the other two subjects, the rights of, of citizens and uh, the question of, of Ireland. As I said, they're a whole, they're indissociable. For the rest, uh... As to the rest, being very frank, uh, objectively, I see no logical and coherent link 
between a discussion that we will have and, and open as soon as possible, and, and which must be ambitious about the, the future, what I've been calling the new partnership between the United Kingdom and the European Union in many areas, trade, security and defence, fighting terrorism, but perhaps other areas as well. That is a discussion for the future. There's no link. There is no possible link, the way we see it, no possible link between that discussion and a discussion about separating the, the separation issues and the, the, the commitments entered into in the past. Thanks, Alexander. I was afraid that you are giving the floor only to British journalists. Uh, Gary Gotter from your active in Brussels. Uh, my question is on citizens, but it's a little bit uh, on the side. I mean, uh, after the orderly Brexit, uh, uh, will the UK uh, be free to impose uh, visas to, let's say, Polish, Bulgarian, Romanian citizens, perhaps a couple of other countries as well? Uh, or uh, a commitment uh, not to do so would be uh, part of, uh, of the deal. Uh, and since I, I, I don't think I will be able to, uh, to ask a follow-up question, uh, if, if this is not part of the discussions, why? Because the interests of uh, several countries are very seriously uh, concerned. Well, yes, I mean, we will. I mean, your, your strict question, will we be free to? Yes, we will be no longer a member of the European Union. We'll be free to uh, operate our migration policy as we see fit. As I've said before, uh, that does not mean that uh, people from European Union countries will not be able to come to Britain and work in Britain, but uh, we'll have that freedom. The question was really for Davis rather than uh, for, for, for David rather than for me, wasn't it? We're discussing objectively all, all the, the subjects where some uncertainty is created in general terms. Uh, and we've taken all these subjects, and I think David talked about the 14 documents that the UK has published, and we've published 14 documents, on all sorts of subjects, wherever there's uncertainty. And the f first priority is, of course, citizens, the people. Uh, we want to make their rights secure, reciprocally, on the basis of non-discrimination, on the basis of continuity of rights. Uh, all those rights acquired up to, to Brexit and rights acquired by families, that's very important as well. And that security should be there for their whole life. And we're talking about everything acquired up to the point of Brexit. Uh, on the 29th of March, or 30th of March of 2019 at midnight, the United Kingdom becomes a third country. And that applies in every area. I mean, it just becomes a third country. And after that, as you know, and we have this objective to work together on a partnership, a partnership which will be our future relationship, which I hope will be a very strong partnership in many, many areas. But that's a discussion, and we can discuss migration, immigration, the conditions on both sides, but that is a subject which relates to the future of our relationship with a country which has become a third country. It's a completely different legal situation. Rush, this concludes our press conference, and midday will start in about uh, five minutes. Thank you. Well, that was uh, the news conference uh, there by the two main negotiators uh, in uh, Britain's Brexit talks, Michel Barnier and David Davis. And just to sum up, really the most important thing coming out of it uh, was that Michel Barnier said that there had not been sufficient progress made uh, for the European Union to agree, talking about the future relationship. Uh, he still wanted progress uh, in the area of uh, Britain's uh, divorce bill uh, and also on some of the 
questions of citizens' rights, although it should also be said that uh, David Davis stuck a very positive note, saying that a lot of progress had been made, uh, and uh, certainly uh, Michel Barnier did say that in a number of areas he felt there was progress. Uh, he said it could be weeks or months before uh, there was agreement that sufficient progress had been made to move on to stage two. Well, let's go straight uh, uh, for uh, reaction now uh, to uh, the uh, Irish uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Simon Coveney, who's been listening to that and joins us from Dublin. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for waiting and listening to that. I'm sure you'll agree. Fairly important. Uh, are you disappointed or do you agree uh, that things are not yet ready to move on to the next phase of negotiations with Britain? Well, I don't think that's a big surprise. I, I certainly think the Prime Minister's speech last week has changed the tone of the negotiations. Um, um, the feedback we're getting from the negotiations this week was that it was very businesslike. Uh, and that real progress is being made in some areas. So if you, if you take, for example, what's called the common travel area between Ireland and Britain, uh, this is something that's hugely important for British citizens in Ireland and Irish citizens in the UK, uh, uh, ensuring that regardless of Brexit, they will be able to continue to move and live in each other's countries, access social welfare, education, health care, pensions. Uh, they can